Okay, um, I've just been watching the attendee numbers tick over, and I think now would be a good time to start. So, hello everyone, and a very warm welcome to this webinar hosted by the Children's Radio Foundation. Thank you so much for making time to spend with us. My name is Nina Callahan, and I'm the chair of the South African Board, and I'm coming to you from a very chilly Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, just a note that this webinar will end in 30 minutes, but afterwards we'd like to do a question and answer session. So please feel free to drop your question in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. I'm sure by now many of you would be webinar experts. So feel free to do so. Um, throughout the course of the webinar. Thanks so much. So we realize that in times of uncertainty and in times of emergency, like the present moment, radio is a first responder, it's a companion and it's a comfort. Radio is able to reach communities with critical information in languages that we speak, and it is information that reflects local realities. In this COVID-19 moment, radio gets the word out about hand washing, social distancing, and all the protocols that we need to follow to keep ourselves, our families, and our communities safe. Radio also provides a platform for communities to have their say. They're able to voice their concerns about their health, about the economy, and young people are able to express their hopes and anxieties about their future. So today, we're here to learn about 700 Children's Radio Foundation youth reporters in South Africa, Zambia, Tanzania, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and the Ivory Coast. And we learn how they have quickly adapted their reporting and broadcasting methods to reach communities with vital information while keeping safe. So we've put together a short video to show you how Children's Radio Foundation has shifted gear to adapt their methods and their approach to broadcasting during COVID-19. Take a look. Why am I out? Why am I not at home? As a broadcaster, I am an essential worker. What is my job as the facilitator? I produce the show, edit the show, and now I'm about to upload the show so that they can go for a broadcast. It is the 17th of April 2020. Kalon Kalon Plop, Leman Bam, to another edition of Live Wire. Alors, la situation du COVID-19 a beaucoup affecté mon travail en tant que jeune reporter. Je ne peux plus sortir faire les interviews. Et il est très difficile de se rencontrer avec les autres quand vous travaillez. Since the beginning of the pandemic, it's been very important for us at the Children's Radio Foundation to shift our model in order to keep the young reporters safe while they could still report. And we've done that in a couple of ways. The first way is that we've organized remote reporting and broadcast workshops via WhatsApp. Over the last few weeks, we've trained all 700 young reporters in five countries via WhatsApp webinars. 
The other thing that we've done is that we've developed what we call show production guides. They are resources that are sent twice a month to the young reporters on how to report safely and accurately on the pandemic. À ce niveau, euh, nous sommes obligés de faire les interviews par WhatsApp, soit avec les membres de notre famille ou par appel téléphonique. We're no longer doing what we used to do. We are just focusing directly on COVID-19, looking at uh, unemployment, looking at health, mentally, physically. We're just looking at COVID-19 in general. It's very important for us to produce our emissions because, you know, the region of Ghanawa is a region agricole. So here, the population arrive difficult to have the information, and especially with these false rumors that circulate on the social media. So it's our mission to be able to give the real information. Because beyond the passion of the work, our objective is to save lives. It's important that we continue to report even if it's from the comfort of our own homes because we not only produce um, award-winning shows but we continue to serve and educate our fellow young people in the community about this coronavirus as a whole and how it affects us. Our role at the Children's Radio Foundation now more than ever is to provide support to the young reporters to amplify their voices. They're really creative with technology and they really want their voices heard. So we're here to provide support, but really the young reporters are leading the way. And I think that now more than ever, it's really important that we have that diversity of voices of young people in the media that can express their realities in this new era of COVID-19. Thank you so much. Um, it was very clear to see how, how radio is still a first choice for news and information for so many people. Um, and to tell us a little bit more of just how Children's Radio Foundation has made quite a mammoth shift um, going online, using different kinds of technology to bring trainings to young people and um, to support young people really to do what they do. I'm joined by three of my friends and colleagues, um, Rachel Bukasa, she manages Children's Radio Foundation international programs in Zambia, Tanzania, the DRC and the Ivory Coast. Welcome Rachel, hi. Hi, thank you so much for having me Nina. Good, you're welcome. And then Tembela Boy, who you met in the video, he is a youth facilitator for the Children's Radio Foundation. And Tembela manages 15 young people, youth reporters in Port Elizabeth in the Eastern Cape in South Africa. And Tembela's come a long way because he was a young reporter himself. A warm welcome, Tembela. Thank you so much, Nina. Thank you. Hi. And then also um, another young person that you saw in the video is 17-year-old Sia Bonga Mokwena. Sia Bonga is coming to us from Emelahleni, which is a town about an hour's drive from Johannesburg in South Africa. Hi, Sia. Nice, nice to see you. Hello, Nina. Thank you for having me. Such a pleasure. So, Rachel, uh, we'll start with you. Um, we're 62 days into a pretty hard lockdown in South Africa. We've just recorded over 24,000 positive coronavirus cases and just today registered just over 500 people who've succumbed to this virus. It's been a dramatic change for everyone here over the past three months. And as we've seen in the video, a drastic change for how Children's Radio Foundation organizes its daily operations and also how you connect and support young people in the field. Now, I know Children's Radio Foundation to be a very nimble organization, but I'm sure there have been incredible challenges along the way. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you've encountered? Yeah, thanks so much, Nina. Um, it's completely true. COVID has changed um, 
the way we do things. It's not business as usual. But as you saw from the video, we have shifted now to remote reporting and we have had to divert resources in order to cover the COVID-19 pandemic. So organizationally, it was challenging for us to reimagine and put in place feasible ways to do three things. One, we needed to figure out how to do remote reporting, two, to produce accurate and verified information and curricular materials on COVID-19, three, and we had to do it and create quality programming that we were used to. So our young reporters cover a range of issues in their broadcast, health, climate change, safety, violence, education opportunity. And in this era, we have had to integrate the reality of COVID into how we, uh, into how we cover these topics. So yes, mobilizing all of our resources into this new reality has been a challenge for the organization. So one of the biggest uh, challenges we've had outside of this has been the issue of access. Number one, our reporters are in the field are in need of access to technology, both in the forms of cell phones as well as data. So both of these elements are critical for this new model of reporting. Mm -hmm. And so for them to get this information and to receive the trainings that we're doing remotely, we've had to give them data so that they can access uh, the internet on their phones. And in cases where they did not have phones, we had to give them access to smartphones as well. Obviously these have cost implications, the cost that we did not anticipate and we continue to seek funding for. Uh, another challenge that our young reporters are facing on the ground is access to education. We are providing tools for remote learning, similar to the ones we implement in our radio learning work that we do in West Africa with UNICEF. And so we connect young reporters to distant learning sources, working directly with departments of education and other education organizations so that they can keep up their schooling. Mm -hmm. So I think these things are things that we've had to sort of manage during the COVID period. Okay. Well, it sounds like um, CRF Children's Radio Foundation has a really critical role to play in support, you know, supporting um, accurate information, getting out there, um, countering disinformation, um, supporting young people in the field and with technology. Um, I know that was happening to an extent, but but this just sounds like quite an exponential uh, change of gear. Wow, well done to everyone uh, in the head office in Cape Town there. So to get a better and more granular picture, um, Sia, I'm going to come to you. Um, I'm I'm in the Western Cape, right? And here we're seeing a high level of food scarcity. Um, we're seeing poorer households really struggling during this time. Um, a lot of concern and confusion around education. Can you tell us how are you doing and what's happening in your community? A very good evening to everybody who's joining us once again. Um, Nina, thank you so much for your question. How am I doing and how's everybody doing in my community? Yeah. So in a sense, we are faced with this COVID-19, as Rachel has mentioned, and it's very quite, it's quite hard for us to, to, to adapt to the new approach to everything that we are doing, a new approach to everything that we are having, a new approach to every challenge that we are encountering. So in a sense, I feel like in my own community, it has actually been very challenging because as Rachel said, not only do us as young reporters encounter challenges as we report, but it's also a very vast thing that actually needs attention because a lot of other people out there are also encountering challenges. For example, um, food scarcity, as, as, as you mentioned. For example, in a sense, everybody has to, 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 not necessarily everybody, but people who are actually in need have to get food parcels and all of that. So that's actually what's happening currently. But in a sense, another thing that I feel is very important to highlight is the fact that it's not everybody who, 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 who gets to, to encounter this, this challenge, this coronavirus thing, because it's always easier to, 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 to actually relate to something that you can see 
so that you actually know what to be preventive of. I'm not sure if preventive is a word, but to be to be aware of in a sense. But in this case, we in our community in MLSA, it's actually very hard to report as young reporters about Children's Radio Foundation because they do not really, we rather, are not really exposed to this coronavirus pandemic as yet. We have had rumors of cases moving and around and within us and our town, but it hasn't really been an important part of the concept to actually highlight on the, on the, the, the bigger level in an instant. For example, it's always hard for us to report and tell somebody about something that they haven't really encountered. So that is one of the challenges along with others that I'm going to take the whole day to mention and of which I don't like to, to actually elaborate on that. <laughs> sure. I think, um, I think explaining things like social distancing um, can become very abstract when the immediate impacts of the virus are not very close to us yet. Um, but I think that just looking at the numbers, you know, see, uh, um, South Africa is registering about a thousand new positive uh, cases every day. So I think maybe in one respect, your job could get a little easier, um, you know, um, unfortunately so. Um, yeah, but it sounds like like all broadcasters really are in for a long haul around um, growing awareness and 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 urging people to follow protocols. So I know that being a reporter is not an easy job, um, and there are very few people who have the gumption for it. Um, tell us what brought you to radio. Why did you sign up? So radio, your radio is a beautiful medium of communication and it's actually nice to know that it has always been there since whenever it began, I haven't really done my research on that, but till today I am very excited to be part of radio. I remember as a young boy, I used to wake up, <laughs> I used to, wake up to, to my grandmother's um, jingles. She used to actually recite those jingles that she used to hear on radio and she would like, it became our daily bread to hear how radio has a great impact. She would tell us that radio is an important medium because we hear things and all of that. Speaking of hearing, I always wanted to see what happens behind this little box, that this, this little box with an aerial that goes up. So I always wanted to, to know more about radio in an instant. So I remember telling my dad that I wanted to be a radio presenter because I had done a little research as far as radio is concerned. And I told my dad that I wanted to be a radio presenter. My dad was like, you want to be a radio presenter, but you are not really doing anything in that case. Go to the local radio station, ask, inquire, get some knowledge about it. So this one day I went there and yo, it was actually quite nice because <laughs> it was my first time in a radio station. And then I met my local facilitator, Noctula Mabuza, who is currently well, as yet, who won the, the, the best youth mentor at the last year's Cape Town Awards. Oh, wow. And she actually invited me in. I, 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 I got to, to experience radio from a very close perspective now because I could like learn everything. And I remember she told me about the auditions that were coming the next week. So I went there, I recited my monologue. I also um, got there and asked a lot of questions. I remember I used to be this very inquisitive young boy about radio. I wanted to know what this button does. I wanted to know every single thing about radio. So radio as a medium actually has a very huge impact, not only in our lives as reporters, but as, as, as well as, as the lives of the people who are on the other side of radio, people who actually yeah. get to hear the stories that we, we pass to. Yes, I feel like that, that is the most important thing that I'd like to, 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 to grasp about radio and the fact that there actually are a lot of opportunities as far as radio is concerned and not only will people want to know the voice behind this whole box like me <laughs> 10 years ago but they would also like to actually interact with these people who are actually behind the radio. Sure and you know Sia it's such a buzz to sit behind a microphone and it's very intimate inside the studio but knowing on the other side they are potentially thousands of people tuning in and listening. 
Um, yeah, I love it. It's great. So tell us about a recent broadcast um, that you've done either pre-COVID or during this time that really had an impact for you and tell us why it had an impact. So one of the recent um, topics that we had as far as COVID-19 is concerned or any other topic that we've had to share about is, is, is one of the ones that I personally, personally reported about. It's the impact of COVID-19 as far as uh, the fourth industrial revolution is concerned. And I remember doing research on that, that alone actually passed a message to a lot of people who are on the other side, thousands of people who are on the other side of, of, of the box and, and who actually didn't know a lot of things, of which is practically one of the reasons why radio is such an important medium. Because in a sense, I remember, um, I spoke and I highlighted the fact that radio, not radio, <laughs> I highlighted the fact that um, the fourth industrial revolution is, is, is very here, it's close by and with its right here, and the COVID-19, it kind of really teaches us a lot about, about the, 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 the fourth industrial revolution that is at the door, that is right close and nearby. So in an instant, and to cut everything short, one of the reports that we, we had to gain was the fact that a lot of people suddenly and, and mysteriously depend on, on the fourth industrial revolution gadgets and technology and devices and, and artificial intelligence for almost everything now because of this COVID-19. So in a sense, I believe I passed on the message to all of the other people on the other side of the box to, 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 to actually get them interested and aware of the fact that as young reporters and, and, and everybody globally, uh, we are now just depending on, on digital space and, and technology for almost everything. I remember um, yep. some of, of the... Uh -huh, I some of the... Mm -hmm. I think that's a really important point that you make, you know, because COVID is in a way facilitating so many different kinds of transitions for all of us. Um, and I think that the transition, kind of mass transition to technology for those who have access is a really big one. I'm just going to go to Timbela. Thank you, Sia, right. for a moment. And um, Timbela, you're, a, you're an old hat already at radio broadcasting and you're now in the role of a youth facilitator. Can you tell us what that is and how has it changed during these times of coronavirus? Mm. Thank you so much, Nina. And I think uh, to explain the role of a facilitator um, in detail, that a facilitator, it's a person who runs the day-to-day -day, um, living or the day-to-day -to -day rating um, of the youth reporters who ensures that these youth reporters are empowered with skills of radio um, from recording, researching, presenting, and even coming up with information for, for the listeners, even mm -hmm. understanding um, their communities. At the very same time, I, I believe that a facilitator goes beyond radio um, into being involved into their lives. I mean, for myself, I've experienced uh, quite a number of uh, situations where I got calls from parents saying that the impact that I'm playing in their child's life is quite a huge one. I remember last year, uh, one of my reporters lost her father and um, she was sort of, um, 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 uh, she, she lost hope into life. And me being involved um, I actually changed her life, uh, not even knowing that I was being alive. And I got a call from her parents saying that, you know what, my child has changed. And it really showed that the, 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 the work of the facilitator is not only about producing hope, but it's about changing lives, starting from our lives into changing the community's lives. And uh, looking at this time of the COVID-19, I think the biggest challenge um, that we are facing is not having those one-on-one -on -one sessions where mm. we could talk about anything be it our social problems, be it the problems that we are facing in our communities. But as much as we are sharing the story, uh, the stories of our communities through our um, 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 shows even now, but the biggest problem is not having our one-on-one. -on -one. Um, at, at the same time, you know, um, I think uh, you have highlighted the fact that um, these devices that we are using to connect for our shows are also a biggest challenge because not all of us can afford them. Uh, data is also another problem. 
uh, as well as not being able to focus on work due to this situation. Because sometimes we've got different situations in our homes where we've got parents who are abusing children. We've got parents who are not even understanding when it comes to this thing of radio, especially now that you're going to broadcast using WhatsApp. They think we are playing. They think we are wasting time. Mm. So those are the challenges that we are facing as young people. Mm. It's yeah. um. I know the Children's Radio Foundation training space, um, the production space, to be a really fun, engaging, and warm environment. Um, and to ha have to do all of that remotely now, I'm sure is just, it, feel, it can feel like such a loss on one level. Um, mm -hmm. But it's incredible how so many of the young people and young reporters have adapted um, to keep the show going. So incredible work there. Sia, I'll ask you the same question. What has, what has changed in how you do your broadcast now during COVID-19? And what are your concerns during this time? Um, firstly, one of the most drastic changes that we've had to encounter is the fact that we do not really get to report on, on the topics that we used to report on previously. But now we just have this whole COVID-19 to focus on. We have um, this whole COVID-19 to report on and to educate a lot of other people about. And another thing that we, we have encountered, another change that we have encountered is the fact that um, they don't really get to do and pose interviews and collect um, formats as much as we used to. I mean. Back in the day, we used to go out and, and, and <laughs> we used to ask people and post interviews with them one on one. And then now all of a sudden, we just have to post interviews online. We just have to ask them to, to send us the, their thoughts on, 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 on different topics on WhatsApp so that they can just give us their views. So in an instant, another important thing that we just have to adapt to now is the fact that we can't really go to studio anymore and get to have that nice experience in, in, in studio where we get to be the guys behind the mic and, and, and all of that. But now we just have to do everything in the very same old dining room that we eat in, basically. Okay. <laughs> well, I think so many of us have to put that production buzz and that live buzz on hold um, and kind of send our recordings to somebody like Timbela, who still gets to be behind the mic, you lucky fish. <laughs> so um, Timbela, I'm going to end with you because we're almost out of time now. Um, how are you feeling about the future? You know, there's such a sense of uncertainty. Um, do you have, do you have a sense of positivity in all of these challenges um, because it has sounded rather rather difficult um, I, I think looking at the situation right now especially in South Africa um, even before the COVID-19 we were battling and even after this, but, you know, I think the biggest challenge is going to face um, a situation of um, um, poverty the situation of unemployment those are the issues that we've been having in South Africa even before COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And now looking at the fact that some, um, some companies and organizations have actually went into lockdown, meaning that they have lost so much money, um, our parents are going to lose work. Um, and that results to us also um, as young people having to actually ha um, suffer from the effects of that. At the very same time, um, the fact that our community now is anxious about everything going back into normal lives will actually put um, too much um, 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 risk into people's lives and actually thinking about the fact that are they con uh, they're going to contract the virus again? What are they going to do after that? So I believe that there's going to be an increase in our socioeconomic issues. At the very same time, there's going to be a very big impact um, on us as young people in terms of school. We have to rush in terms of um, life in general, unemployment, poverty, 
um, our community losing jobs. So I think those are the biggest things. And um, one most big thing that we're going to suffer from after the entire thing is actually being used to the fact of uh, the fact that we need to use um, uh, the fourth industrial revolution or we have to adapt to the fourth industrial revolution because COVID-19 has actually brought it into our world. Mm. Agreed that mm. that coronavirus has really illuminated and amplified a lot of the existing problems that we've had as a country. Um, and it will be interesting to see how um, you know, adaptations in using technology um, could help us, um, could help us reconnect, could help us innovate around industries and jobs. Um, yeah, I'm with you in those concerns for sure, for our country and for so many places in the world. Um, but I'm also really enthused and amazed. I'm listening to you and Sia and Rachel, um, but the two of you, Sia and Timbela particularly, and you are two of 700 Children's Radio Foundation young people who are still making it work. Um, and you're making it work in very challenging conditions, both in your own lives and in your communities. So just really from me, from our friends and supporters and funders and cheerleaders who are also on this webinar, a really big heart salute for the effort and the work and the heart that you still put into it. Thank you so much. So, um, we would like to remind everyone who uh, is still with us that you are able to support Children's Radio Foundation and there are a few links in the chat. Um, so please uh, feel generous after listening to Sia and Rachel and Timbela um, and just how much this shift has asked of the organization. So I see there are a few Q and A's, well, questions. And um, let me have a look at them right now. I think Rachel, this one is for you. It says, are there different challenges you encountered in countries other than South Africa when it came to remote training and reporting? Sure, thanks, Nina. Uh, in terms of challenges, yes, there's been a whole host of challenges we've encountered, but this, for the sake of um, being to the point, I'm going to deal with three particular challenges. And I highlight these ones because they've proven to be consistent across board, across all the countries we operate in. The first challenge we've, we've, um, we've seen is the issue of access to technology, to data and technology. So um, to data and cell phones, excuse me. Uh, part of that is that not only do they not have it and in cases where we've been able to provide data for the young reporters or cell phones, the second stage to that is the issue of a young reporter who's not used to manipulating a smartphone is suddenly expected to go through these um, online trainings and doing all of this. So that has been the initial uh, challenge. The second challenge we've experienced outside of resources has been the issue of literacy and reading culture in certain spaces. Because remember, our work, we work across rural areas, very urban areas, all of those. And so reading culture and, and literacy has also proven to be an issue particularly when you do a training or when you remote report that relies on the ability to read and to read at a certain pace and a certain kind of material. That has been the second big thing we've seen across board. And the third one has been just being able to deal with uh, contextual nuances and challenges. So what works in one country, for example, is not necessarily what works in another country when it's um, it, it comes to time or how things can get done, particularly when gender roles falls into place in some countries, it's more acceptable for boys to do certain things like take part in a training and for three, four hours without stopping. Whereas for the girls, it's different for them. The expectation is that they should stop and mm -hmm. cook, that kind of thing. Yeah. And so those are just sort of the different challenges uh, we've experienced across board, but none of them are insurmountable. Okay. 
Thanks, Rachel. I'm just going to keep you on this sure. train of thought a little bit because there's um, a question that says, if we could help CRF with some extra funding, what would your priorities be for using it? And I'm imagining it would be around just what you've mentioned around access to data and devices and materials development. Yeah. So one of the, the, the great thing about the work we do is that all, that all the funding we receive go directly to the benefit of the young reporters we work with. Um, and so right now, if we were to receive extra funding, our, our priorities are to grant access to those who do not have, because the reality as things stand is that access to things like cell phones are going to mean that essentially certain young people will not be able to continue to participate in the program if they don't have it. So our priorities right now are definitely to ensure that there's access to phones, there's money for internet, um, particularly in where it's remote reporting and sometimes guests might have issues, um, getting out material um, for COVID and around COVID and training. So essentially a lot of it has to do, has to do with that. That is going to be our priorities to make sure that the young reporters have the resources and materials to continue the work they've been doing. Great, thank you so much, Rachel. Um, there's a question from Edward Mortimer mm -hmm. and this one I'll direct to Timbera yeah. and Sia. Mm -hmm. It's, and Edward's question is, in many parts of the world, there is great concern about the increase of domestic violence during lockdowns. Is this a problem in Africa? And are CRF reporters finding a way to deal with it? Tim Bella and Sia, do any of you have a, an answer for this one? Okay, I think I can try to answer that one. Um, in South Africa, um, we actually went to lockdown. And whilst we were on a lockdown, there was um, one of the regulations was that alcohol must not be sold. And um, mm -hmm. it was reported that um, there wasn't a decrease in the number of crime. But on the other hand, there was an increase on the number of domestic violence. I think it was um, 89,000 um, on the first 30 days of the lockdown, which actually raised the number of concerns. And we, as the youth reporters in Port Elizabeth, took time to look into what have actually contributed into that. And you found that most into sitting home. So in this case, maybe they're um, and spending more time in their homes. They are now putting them more into their mind with their brain, which in other ways affects them to actually distress um, 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 using bars to the members of family, which is something that has actually contributed to them. We're still looking into actually following those numbers now that um, there is the level three lockdown regulation that is coming on the 1st of June. And um, we, have see, we are seeing that there's going to be the ease of some regulations like alcohol. So we want to look in terms of does really alcohol contribute into the number of domestic violence that we have in South Africa, or um, it's just the situation of people being under lockdown and not being able to go anywhere and staying with their families. So I think those are some of the things that we, that we have seen um, over the period of the COVID-19, as well as the domestic violence. Okay, thank you, Timbela. And just for everyone else, um, Timbela is talking about the 89,000 um, calls into the national hotline for um, gender-based violence and domestic violence. Um, yes, we have seen those, those numbers skyrocket um, and it is really a big concern. Um, I think we have time for one more question. And uh, I somehow seem to have lost the Q&A. Oops. Oh, there we go. And um, this one is from Bill Simmering. And Bill is asking, especially about safety inside of um, the broadcast studios, since the virus is transmitted by fine drops in the air. Um, how do the young people protect themselves and the microphones when in studio? 
I assume that one is for me, right? Sure, you can go for it. Okay. All right. Um, I think um, as the facilitator who actually goes to the studio every now and then, um, we, in, in our station, we've got sanitizers as well as um, 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 we've got also protective equipment um, that we can use as presenters. And we've got scanning machines that actually scan our temperatures. Um, but also there's COVID-19 around because our station is situated in an area called Guadwisi, which, which was one of the hotspots um, right here in the Nelson Mandela Bay. So going into that area makes you never seen away because you fear for your life, the fact that you're going to contract the virus. But luckily for me, I'm using private transportation to the station. So okay. at least um, I am secured in that context. But when I, got, when I get there, um, it's a matter of ensuring and, and making sure that I am protected using the provided equipment by the station, um, as well as ensuring that everything goes accordingly with my life, as well as I do not take the virus. Sure. Thank you. you know, I could just jump in. Um, I see that Bill's question is around um, the young reporters being a bit too close. I think one of the big uh, things we had to take on at the beginning of, of COVID-19 was teach the young reporters how to report safely. And part of those were hygiene habits as well. And so exactly just like Tembele mentioned, it's it's making sure this the thing, all our recorders are sanitized, uh, our young reporters are sanitized and just knowing how to maintain social distance. And then I just did want to add one more thing in terms of the, so, uh, the domestic violence question is that we have produced a show production guide that has been designed specifically to deal with the issue of domestic violence. And so that deals with it in a way that takes into consideration the cultural sensitivities around it and how young reporters can directly deal with it. So that is something we've produced for the young reporters. Amazing. Okay, thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Timbela. Thank you, Sia. I think we've come to the end of our time. Um, again, from all of the people who have um, signed into this webinar, I know that they all send their best wishes. There are a few mentions in the chat to all of you. So please have a look there before you sign off. Um, and we wish you well in this long journey ahead of you. And uh, Sia, I'm sure that your job will perhaps get a little easier um, as time goes. Um, and yeah, blink and poor people. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much to our attendees for staying on and for giving of your time. Thank you so much. Um, there is a reminder as well for any of those um, links for donations in the chat. For the UK, there is also a just giving link so there you go. Thank you so much for spending time with us. Goodbye.